everybody for joining us today and uh, this uh, IC briefing on good practices in operationalizing collective approaches to accountability to affected people. Uh, my name is Aida Magistu. I'm the uh, deputy head of the IAC's peer-to-peer -peer support project. I'm here on behalf of Mervat Shabaya, the head of the IAC secretariat, who unfortunately could not join us today. Uh, today is International Women's Day, so I'll start uh, by wishing you all a happy uh, International Women's Day, uh, um, and particularly to our all female panelists today. As humanitarians, uh, our pri primary responsibility is to uh, the people affected by crisis. Uh, really, this is the, the, the sole reason why uh, our institutions and programs uh, exist. Uh, it, their needs, priority, voices really should inform our, um, our actions. And this is something that the humanitarian system has strived to do. Uh, for, for decades now. Um, and in recent years, there's been reforms at the systems level, at the individual agency level to really um, uh, work on, on, on this. And there has been progress. And we've seen a, a, a humanitarian action that is more responsive and more people-centered uh, um, in recent years. However, um, a lot more needs to be done. Uh, the IEC principles recently recognized that despite the progress, communities continue to report that unfortunately the humanitarian system does not sufficiently listen to and incorporate the views, priorities, and capacities of affected communities. Today, we have a very strong panel to discuss uh, not only the progress made to date, but also what we could do, uh, what needs to be done uh, by sharing good practices and some lessons from various humanitarian operations. I am extremely honored uh, to be joined by uh, four um, uh, excellent panelists. Uh, Ms. Catherine Sozi, very honored to have you on, the, on with, uh, with us today. Uh, Ms. Catherine Sozi currently serves as resident and humanitarian coordinator in Ethiopia, a medical by training, she previously served as the regional director for Eastern and Southern Africa for, uh, for the United Nations program on HIV and AIDS, UNAIDS, working for that organization for 18 years as country representative in many different countries, Zambia, South Africa, China. Prior to joining the UN system in 2000, she worked with governments, private sector, non-governmental organizations in the UK, Uganda, South Africa, focusing on planning and delivering services to, to people. Uh, she's joined by Ms. Leila Hasso, uh, who's the communications and advocacy manager with the Huras Network in Syria and Turkey. Leila leads campaigns to raise awareness and action for child protection and education, including to, uh, through the Syrian Child Protection Network, which was established in 2012. Leila is a member of the Humanitarian Liaison Group in Gaziantep. This is the equivalent of a humanitarian country team and is a national of Syria. Welcome, uh, Leila. Um, Ms. Alexandra Sikote Levesque is the other panelist. Uh, she's the Community Engagement Manager with the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. Alexandra has more than two decades of experience in humanitarian uh, response, uh, having previously worked with the UN and NGOs in various operations, including South Sudan, Jordan, Iraq, Haiti, and the Philippines. Alexandra is also a journalist and a filmmaker. Alexandra co-founded the nonprofit organization Jour Journalist for Human Rights in 2002 and produced several films. And uh, last but not least, um, uh, please um, help me welcome Ms. Dorina Andriev Jitaru, who is the Regional Ad Advisor on Communication for Development with UNICEF and uh, Southeast Asia Regional Office. 
Dorina has more than 20 years of experience in the field of behavior change, social and gender norms, community engagement, as well as civil registration. She pre previously worked for several UN agencies and NGOs in more than 20 countries across the globe, developing, implementing, and assessing community engagement interventions in humanitarian and development context. Welcome to the, our panelists. As per usual practice, we will uh, hear first from the panelists and then uh, we'll open the floor for to, to questions. Um, I'll ask the, the, the panelists to, to keep their interventions um, concise so we have uh, ample time uh, uh, to, to really engage in the, in, the, in the discussion later on with the participants. Uh, for the participants, please use the chat box to share your thoughts or flag any questions that you may have for our panelists. Um, I kindly also ask our participants to please mute yourself um, throughout the presentations. Um, allow me to start with Ms. Catherine uh, Sozi. Um, Catherine, as a humanitarian coordinator, uh, you have an important role, a uh, leadership role to, to drive the collective response in, in the country. Can you speak to us about the importance of leadership? on the ground, setting the tone in prioritizing collective accountability to affected communities. Uh, specifically, it will be great to learn of best practices and concrete actions um, that you have taken uh, and, and taken by field leadership to better engage and respond to the feedback received by communities. Over you, to you, you, Catherine. Thank you, Ida, and good afternoon um, to colleagues. Um, I'm delighted to take part in this panel. Um, thank you for this opportunity to, pro to brief you on the good practices in Ethiopia and the importance of leadership, as Ida has said, um, to help us achieve our collective commitments of the 2016 Grand Bargain, to give more space to and get more means into the hands of people in need, and also to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our action um, for them. I also want to take this opportunity this time to appreciate the leadership um, and collective support of the UNSG, the ERC, and all those on the IAC um, um, principles and the emergency directors who have made great efforts and, and have provided a lot of support to us here in Ethiopia. And of course, I join this panel today um, to speak about the leadership on the ground um, and the best practices and some of the concrete actions that we in Ethiopia have taken to better engage and respond to the feedback received by communities. We've grappled in Ethiopia with the many crises affecting millions of people in the recent years. Um, and we've, you know, we've called for the urgent, effective and efficient action to deliver assistance. Um, given the ever limited resources available. Addressing the needs of peoples affected by many crises require all of us as partners to ensure that people receiving the assistance are included in making the decisions which affect their lives. Um, and their inclusion and participation must be meaningful and must be active and should also be our foundation for working across the nexus, um, the HB, HDP nexus, to reduce those needs over time. And this is a key focus of the UN, um, not only the UN, the HCT, but the UN country team. And I believe we have made significant efforts to engage better and respond to the feedback. Um, coming from UNAs where communities keep saying nothing about us without us, um, for, my, for me, um, personally, on a personal level, um, this mantra rings well, even within the humanitarian saying, and it rings in my head and my heart each, each, each time we have a meeting where we discuss progress or whether we're planning the HNO or, or otherwise. Uh, in Ethiopia, the HCT in the recent years has ensured that accountability is integrated into the humanitarian program cycle, I, I, I assume as it is in most countries, including in the HNO development, the humanitarian needs overviews, the humanitarian response plan, the, the financing and the program monitoring, starting 
and finishing with the communities themselves. And I just want to give just a few highlights. For instance, we've established technical working groups and networks um, with link strategies and work plans on AAP, PSCA community engagement. We've endorsed the, uh, the ISC SOPs for community-based complaints and feedback mechanisms, including the GBV referrals to support services that are available. We've actually developed information campaigns with linked information, education and communication in local languages. And we have designed or domesticated what I call the domesticated um, trainings on AAP community engagement um, and risks assessment. Building on this and under the leadership of the HCT, we have a working, the working group basically has taken key actions to promote the inclusion of communities and that they are meaningfully and actively, and I keep saying that because it's real, it's not just a question of tokenism, um, involved in decisions that directly impact their lives. So it's a bit of affirmative action from our end. We have developed a communications and community engagement plan um, together with the communities, um, following particularly the negative sentiments observed among the populations, as well as within the government of Ethiopia structures and authorities on the assistance. And this was highlighted clearly over the last year um, during the conflict, the Northern Ethiopia conflict and the time um, that we have had to work with. We have and are addressing the commitments on, in the overall humanitarian response. Um, I think accountability to the AAP has a dedicated section. We had to put it there that is in the HNO, the HRP, and that the accountability, the AAP questions are mandatory fields in the response plan project sheets. So, you know, if we don't put it there, it's not collected, then we will never uh, find it there. So. But we're also in the process of creating what we call a community voices and accountability platform that showcases feedback gathered by community members through consultations and surveys. And we plan, and this is in the plan, to generate those regular reports based on the information um, that we receive. We believe that data will talk to you if you're willing to listen. And I think this is really important and I'll share what um, that means um, later on. We've also rolled out an online accountability to affected people training course here in Addis, and we've sent it, to, uh, um, connected it to the field locations, and so far trained over 200 humanitarian actors, um, keeping uh, some of the topics around the humanitarian principles and approaches to strengthen communication with communities. Um, the AAP Technical Working Group um, has been established in all across the country. We've, at the moment, we've got working networks in four big regions in the country where we've got not only northern Ethiopia, but where the drought is taking place at the moment. So making sure it gets away from Addis and gets down to the staff and humanitarians that are, on, are, are in the field. And follow-up discussions are happening within us at the UN. What is clear, Ida, is that nearly most UN entities have an approach to accountability to affected persons. They may call it something different, but in the meantime, what we need to do is work with the language so that whether it's UNICEF on children, UNAs with people living with HIV, IOM with migrants, that the people remain at the center of, of our programming because that's the center of our cooperation framework and our HCT. And to scale up the capacity, of course, um, we have um, put in surge capacity that have been deployed last year, um, two from OCHA and two from Plan International, to ensure that it helps the fast tracking of the work. What we now need to do is to ensure sustainability and continuity, and that we need to work hard in ensuring that national staff carry forward the baton, even as the surge capacity leaves. And finally, we have piloted the allocation of funding um, because without using the financing channels um, to cross-cutting networks, including PSCA with interagency projects across line, um, so that this ensures that it's connected to some of the country-based pooled funding, and we don't assume that AAP will just happen by itself, but that there are resources um, to, to keep it going. While we've made some progress over the year, we continue to face important challenges um, to ensure that we really meet what we desire. 
and uh, despite our ongoing efforts to do so, um, affected people, the feedback we're getting is that the beneficiaries do not feel totally included in some of the key decision making around the assistance, including the identification of needs. And we think that our identification of needs process is pretty comprehensive, but clearly it's not comprehensive it's enough. And so more consultations are required. Not only that, they feel that sometimes when they provide responses, we don't respond adequately. For instance, even though the affected population requests for cash as opposed to material goods, we still, for some reason, are hesitant to provide that cash um, and prefer to sort of move truckloads of food. Um, right, and, and really, we need to respond. Otherwise, communities will lose, lose faith in what we put forward. The other second uh, um, 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 issue that has come up is the low levels of, by the affected populations to access the complaints and feedback mechanism regarding the assistance they require they receive. Uh, also, that aid workers do often sometimes not communicate adequately, sometimes not in the local language of the people affected, and sometimes not looking out for the most, most, most vulnerable, particularly around women, particularly around people with who are differently abled, um, and pick, particularly for the young people who assume some household or a man will make the decisions for them. So, in order to address these challenges, we will focus on linking up with the representatives at national, regional and district levels to share information on the assistance, the assistance being provided while at the same time ensuring that they affirmatively ensure that the voices of all community members, especially the groups that I've talked about, are actually heard and brought to the table. We will also, and we are doing so, um, strengthening our linkages with some of the key people at the community level, el the elders, not uh, particularly the women elders, because our focus here in Ethiopia has been very much the, the men are very visible, but the women we need to look out for. The young people, clan, the, the, the religious circle people, and to ensure representation is really meaningful. Lastly, I would like to also say that we need to look, uh, we're looking to better link this humanitarian response and accountability to affected population with our focus on the Agenda 2030. The, the mantra for that is leave no one behind. And for people, regardless of how we categorize them, the needs are needs. We must therefore not ensure that we work hand in hand as a single UN and as a community to ensure to better engage affected populations and to address the urgent needs, but also build the longer term resilience over time so that we are out of a job at some stage. Leave no one behind continues to be the focus of the UN development system and those caught in the humanitarian crises are the same people who are most vulnerable, who need a life of dignity and whose quality of life must be addressed and served. I'll stop here, Ida, and willing to hear suggestions on the way forward for the experts on the team and also from the audience as we move forward. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I, I'm not going to um, recap everything that you said, but just a few highlights, some takeaways before we move on to, to, to the, the next panelist. I think you highlighted very um, uh, in a powerful way the role of leadership in advocacy and, and making sure that um, really this meaningful and active uh, engagement of, of affected communities is really the, the what what um, everybody needs to strive for. Um, the mantra of nothing about us without us, that's very catchy and very uh, powerful and uh, thanks for, for, for uh, saying that. Um, you highlighted that uh, really throughout the, the humanitarian program cycle from uh, really from um, needs assessments to the response, to the planning, to um, the evaluation, to the funding, all that needs to really integrate uh, this meaningful and active participation of, of the affected communities. And that having a dedicated um, capacity investing, uh, you spoke about the technical working group, uh, re really doing a lot of work and heavy lifting the, the, the importance of this uh, uh, effort to be not only at the central level, but also decentralized uh, to make sure that there is really, uh, 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 you know, from all fronts, uh, this is prioritized. Um, the 
importance of really injecting uh, capacity at the outset to to roll all this um, uh, super important, but also uh, having a, a way to to have it sustained to be sustained um, uh, and uh, to, to investing in in the uh, existing capacity was 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 very. Um, uh, well noted, and also he spoke about the importance of really kind of ground truthing uh, all that um, effort and um, and and uh, you know uh, catching the challenges and continuing to work on them. Um, and so, thank you so much. That was really really um, helpful. Uh, I'll now turn um, to uh, the next um, uh, speaker, uh, Leila. I'll go to you next, um, Leila. Um, can you um, share uh, insight as a local um, uh, or uh, NGO representative on the importance of the inclusion of the voices of affected communities in the HLG? This is the equivalent of the humanitarian country team in Gaziantep. Equally, Given the access challenges in Northwest Syria, can you give a visual on how community engagement is possible through cross-border operations? Over to you. Thank you, Aida. Uh, can you share the presentation? Yes, we're in the process of doing that. There you go. Okay. okay. And the next. Uh, first of all, thanks for giving me the opportunity uh, to participate in this uh, important event. Uh, I want to start to highlight the situation. After 11 years, the Syrian response has delivered humanitarian aid for to over 6 million people, the majority of whom are women and children. This was based on remote response for many years. However, the remote model caused a communication gap that go worse year by year. There were attempts to improve communication and engagement, but they were insufficient. Much feedback we were getting was telling us that the response didn't meet people's needs. In 2021, we as those in charge of humanitarian response had to take bold action to enforce accountability and ensure the implementation of the AAB, planned at the global humanitarian level. Humanitarian decision makers helped develop the action plan for change. A 10-point guide to listening carefully to affected people, responding effectively and communicating sensitively, and those be able to implement in a more accountable manner to the affected population. Next slide. Um, next. So far, our experience has been as following. Out of the 10 HLG meetings held, none have been convinced without the participation of representatives of affected people. There has been a diverse range of ages and genders. We enable people to share their concerns as well as their experience and suggestions to improve our response. I can say now that as a result of this participation, the level of coordination across, across clusters was improved. In addition, we have also noticed a new language that we hadn't used before, focusing on setting those affected at the heart of every intervention by HLG members. I believe the major objective for inviting them to this meeting was to bridge the communication gap with decision makers. And I could say we succeeded in managing that. Uh, next slide. <laughs> How did we get to this brave decision and accept responsibility for it? We used unconventional thinking, for providing translation, and leaned heavily on technology. We rely on local community networks, 
of humanitarian workers on the ground. And I'd like to invite you to do that same in this meeting today. We have to redirect the response or being instructed by decision maker in NGOs or INGO to one that puts people in the center, especially after 10 years of supply chain approach. It was our responsibility to support decision makers to make decisions that are in line with the needs of priorities of the affected people, which is reflected in the cost effectiveness. Next slide. I will give you an example about that. People living in Northwest Syria have been asking us stop, to stop giving them tents as shelter. Two billion dollars were spent on temporary shelter that can only last for six months before being damaged and replaced the following year. Now we will invest in dignified shelter and living condition, which will provide warmth in winter and ventilation in summer and most importantly be safe shelter during minor storm and poor weather I, it will be important to present affected people with range of potential shelters and let them tell us what works best rather than being paying every year for response team salaries and charging the temporary shelter which we all know will be damaged with the first rain or snowfall. Next slide. Let me tell you how the affected people are for, fully aware of how the intercluster system should function. In one camp, in one camp, there I there where I was supervising the production of a film that asking kids what kind of response they, uh, they prefer. The answer was surprised me. One of the children, you can see him in the uh, uh, slide, who was an 11 years old boy named Omar, gave me an answer that matched the response of the best program manager uh, working within the organization, multi-sectoral organization. He told me to make sure that my needs were met, you must first provide me and my friends with a strong tent that will not not to, to be destroyed at the first major weather condition change. And then you must ensure that the way to my school is always open. You also need to ensure that there is a medical center close to my home in case I become sick in winter. Finally, I don't need more basket food. I would rather prefer to rely on my father, work to, my, to make a living for my family. Very smart boy. <laughs> Next slide. Why do we have to listen to them? Affected people may be able to advise us on how to improve inter interagency response and programming. They are the only ones who can provide us the genuine information that doesn't necessarily reflect the interest of response actors, which are mostly technical in nature and have become part of the supply chain system. We need to trust the affected people. They know the problem better than us, and they, those, they better know the solution. We need to empower them. We need to think about their right in recognizing their voice and agency, not just their needs. It's now our turn to use this information in the right way to provide a comprehensive response. Why do we have to listen to them? My simplest answer is that because we work for them at the, in the first place. And this is my <laughs> intervention. Great. Thank you so much, Dorina. That was really quite a compelling um, uh, presentation on really the, the 
the importance of having affected the affected people, uh, you know, participate in the humanitarian response, uh, really quite um, innovative indeed. Um, in in the case of Gaziantep, that you have uh, actual affected communities be part of the HLG discussions, um, quite um, a, a very good practice indeed that could be replicated elsewhere. Um, and you mentioned um, tools and the, 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 the such as translation and and, and others that need to be invested in order to make that happen. And I really appreciate that you've um, also in your presentation included pictures and stories that really put us uh, ourselves here in, that, in, 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 in uh, really understanding um, of, of what the great work that you're, you're doing. Thank you so much. Um, I'll uh, now turn to Alexandra. Um, uh, Alexandra, um, IIFRC, has been a proponent of community engagement uh, and has adopted a movement wide commitments uh, for community engagement and accountability. Can you share your views of what successful collective accountability to affected populations looks like? What are the key ingredients to achieve the golden star standard, quote unquote, in collective AAP? And how is it possible to do it with challenges in quality funding? Over to you. Thanks so much. And I think Catherine and Leila have already um, brought up in their great experiences some of the points I'm going to make. Um, so maybe I'll just first take a little bit of a step back and look at um, the word accountability, because it's, it's a big word that often I think creates confusion and also sometimes scares some people. Um, but ultimately, accountability is the acceptance, uh, uh, the acceptance of responsibility for own our own actions. It implies uh, a willingness to be transparent and also allowing others to observe and evaluate our performance. But tangibly, what does that mean for humanitarians? Um, sometimes I like to turn around a bit and think about what we need to deliver our work. Um, one way to look at it is trust. Um, it's a commodity that humanitarians have always relied on and perhaps that we've also taken for granted too often. Um, but as we now know more than ever, trust is not really acquired overnight. It's something that we earn gradually uh, by including the people we serve in the decisions that impact their lives by being transparent when something um, doesn't work out as expected. Um, so so we, we now know that humanitarian responses which ignore community feedback and participation are neither effective nor efficient. Um, and it often leads to distrust of humanitarian organizations. That to me should really be the bedrock of why being accountable to the people we serve is so critical to our work. Um, recent crises and especially um, the current pandemic have shown that we need um, to do uh, things differently. Um, but to do that, it really will require disruptive steps. And um, ultimately, our sector needs to shift power structures and adopt ways of working that are really going to turn upside down um, a decades old system. So we also need to be realistic that this is going to take time. Um, and the commitment to ensure real participation goes way beyond um, setting up hotlines and suggestion boxes. Um, I think um, as humans, we all like um, quick fixes, but unfortunately, if we're going to do this right, it's gonna be a bit more complex. Um, it's about hiring and training the right people, collecting and analyzing community insights as scale to adapt our work, um, and ensuring continuous dialogue to make real changes in the way we operate. Um, so to go back to your question, um, Ida, what have we really learned um, so far in collectively? One thing that I think that's so central that we've learned is that um, we really need to focus on operational coordination at the very early stage of a response. Um, we have the crisis in Ukraine unfolding as we speak, and this is so critical at this stage. Um, listening and engaging with people at an early stage, and, uh, at an early stage, but also ensuring that we collectively engage um, the decision. Sorry, uh, can I can I ask you to mute your participants? Um, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, not sure who mute, but. They there you go. Oh, no. Sorry, participants, whoever is, uh, can you please mute? Thank you. So I was trying to find the person to mute them, sorry. Um, so yeah, I was saying that it's really important at the early stage to ensure that um, that we engage the decision machine um, earlier based on people's views. So 
that we kind of counteract um, the tendency of agencies and donors to first set the programming priorities and then consult. Unfortunately, we do um, to this day too much of that. Um, and we also need to anticipate the planning of resources for accountability and coordination capacity, which are needed so that we can adapt engagement and adapt programming through different stages of the response. Um, another aspect um, I think that we've learned um, collectively is the importance of leadership within our organizations, but as well um, in terms of the humanitarian leadership as a whole. Um, we really need to have the investment of leadership to operationalize our collective commitments. Um, if I'm going to be honest, often I feel like we hear from leadership that even though there's a will to engage communities, it's not really realistic to be able to listen to affected people especially those um, that are the hardest to reach. Unfortunately, this mindset often prevents us from even doing the basics and the minimum. Um, as we see over and over in uh, crisis prone countries like Haiti, where we still struggle to provide basic information to communities. Um, the impact of course uh, of this is distrust, unrest, and um, ultimately the lack of sustainability of our work. So, um, so it means that even though it's difficult and it's complex, um, we also need to be open-minded enough to learn um, from our failures. So um, I have an example um, from the Red Cross, for instance, where we have tried to do new approaches, but of course at times we've succeeded and at times we have not. And it's, and it's a risk we have um, to be willing to, to take on. So for example, in, in Mozambique in 2019, after uh, Cyclone Adai, we engaged communities to um, directly participate in the design implementation of what the IFRC network could provide um, for their recovery. Um, so in practice, we did a lot of things right. Uh, leadership in country developed a long-term recovery plan and allo allocated enough funding um, for the effort. A staff supported the approach, community buy-in and satisfaction was pretty high. But ultimately, we faced a lot of challenges. And um, for instance, there was a lack of clarity around budget and procurement capacity and high staff um, turnover uh, led to kind of overcommitment and under delivery to communities. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details, but the point is that setting up a thorough community engagement approach throughout the response and ultimately recovery um, is much more complex than, um, than we might think. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. It means that we need to uh, basically take a risk and invest in it um, and also uh, take the time and ensure that we have the, resource, the resources and the commitment to oversee the process until the end. Um, often one of the challenges is that donor requirements um, and operational timeframes push us to take a quantity over quality approach to, so that we can demonstrate tangible outcomes. Um, this is why on earmark funding with the dedicated funding for accountability is so critical. So um, ultimately our experiences um, in Mozambique um, together with our collective learnings in our global response to COVID-19 and, and recent crises show that learning from our failures and building on our successes strengthens our program effectiveness, effectiveness um, which ultimately is a major precursor to building trust. So if we're really ready um, as a humanitarian sector to take our commitments um, seriously, and especially our collective commitments, um, it means that we really need to establish healthy partnerships with the communities we serve based on equality and respect. And it means communities have a central role in the decisions that determine their own lives, but also that um, it means that we need to be able to be prepared uh, for and responding to disasters together. Um, and that we need to capital, capitalize as organization on each other's respective know-how and competencies. So is it gonna be uncomfortable in the process? Um, yes, definitely, but I don't think there's a doubt that ultimately on the long-term, it's gonna be worth it. So I'll uh, leave it at that for now and um, leave some space for discussion. Thanks so much, Aida. Great, thank you so much, Alexandra. That really, uh, I thought you put it very well and complimented, uh, complimented um, Leila and, um, and Catherine's uh, presentations, uh, really to, to outline why this is important, but also more, um, uh, uh, how much investment really is required uh, at the, you know, uh, at the initial stages of, of, of a response and, and throughout uh, in order to make this happen, because it is about, uh, you know, complete change of the, of the current system, the, the, the shift of power, et cetera. So um, thank you so much, Alexander, for that. Um, I'll now turn to Dorina. Uh, Dorina, you've worked uh, both in development and humanitarian settings. What lessons and experience can we draw 
on from your work with UNICEF in development settings on collective AAP. And also uh, grateful if you can speak to us about some of the critical uh, work um, that UNICEF and UNHCR have spearheaded with the IEC through the result group two to advance AAP. Over to you. Okay. Hi, hello <clears throat> everyone. Happy to be here. I have a presentation. Uh, it comes quickly, but I want to emphasize once again, uh, nothing about us without us. I think we need to remember that uh, if we want to bring benefits to the communities and not just spend money. Uh, yes, please uh, go ahead with the next slides. Yes. Okay. Next one. Okay. I will start quickly to talk about some of the work in uh, the interagency standing committee. I don't, I'm not involved in this work. I, I know about it. So I will talk quickly about that, but um, my colleagues will share in the chat a link to a number of uh, uh, documents and materials and examples which could be used by our colleagues in, in their work afterwards. Uh, first of all, UNICEF is uh, uh, co-lead the, the uh, ISC uh, results group on accountability and, and inclusion and based on this uh, work, uh, a suite of AP uh, tools um, are currently rolled out in uh, in, in some countries. Uh, these tools will be, uh, first of all, um, tested uh, in, in a number of contexts. Uh, is in Gaziantep, uh, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, Lebanon, and Haiti, uh, with a view to be finalized by by the end of quarter 2022. And the tools is the AP framework, I am, uh, um, which sets uh, the five outcomes required uh, uh, at the country level uh, to improve the quality, effectiveness, uh, and accountability of uh, humanitarian responses. There is also the results tracker, which goes hand in hand with the AP uh, framework. Um, the common uh, standards and principles uh, for feedback mechanisms, and also, uh, uh, an accountability and inclusion portal, uh, which uh, can be uh, used by the practitioners as a one-stop shop, where they can find uh, guidance, relevant information, and everything they need uh, to make sure um, uh, they, they work uh, is responding to, to the standards. And it includes also a help desk and a service directory. So. Uh, this is shortly uh, about this, um, uh, the, the work UNICEF, UNHCR, uh, and uh, others are doing in the uh, Interagency Standing Committee. But then, next, let's move to some practical examples uh, about what um, AP is about. And is AP only linked to emergencies? Because um, what happens when a uh, main emergency strikes? We have a lot of questions and we as professionals uh, uh, are running around uh, trying to understand where, how, uh, where are those in need of immediate assistance? How do we reach those uh, affected ones, the information they need? What support uh, they need? How do we inform about service availability? provide life-saving saving information, how do we deliver support, what are the potential partners on the ground, and um, how do we ensure that the support we are really delivering reaches those affected and not others, uh, how, what are the complaints and how we can respond to these complaints, how do we encourage uh, those affected to help each other and care for each other. Um, so, a number of questions which take us time to respond. And in the beginning, we are trying, you know, to rush into the action. But 
by the way, the systems should be there already in place in, and used before. They should only be adapted. And those systems should be used during the development uh, stage, not when the emergency strikes. Next slide, please. Uh, so, in normal development, uh, development settings, we do have a number of activities, a number of interventions and systems to build in order to have everything well prepared if or when the emergency uh, will, will come. Uh, we have to put in place community inte intelligence system or so-called social listening systems to develop plans, to foster alliances, partnerships, to understand who is working where in the respective country, who is uh, covering every community and through whom or with whom we can work together. Then uh, work, uh, develop coordination mechanisms at the country level, uh, but also in the regions. Um, identify uh, what will be the offline and online platforms and mechanisms to, to be uh, used, put in place a complaint mechanisms and, and start using them even for in, in development settings uh, because we need information about access to services. We need uh, um, information about uh, the, the uh, perceptions, uh, the, the uh, sentiments at the community level towards different uh, uh, type of interventions we are having in the respective community and put in place and activate community engagement systems, which is a, also a very important step. Because when the emergency strikes, what we do, we just as, adjust the systems as needed and we start providing the information, um, change the procedures if needed and uh, establish trust and credibility with, with, the, with those affected. Uh, then we do have the active, uh, phase which captures and analyzes the feedback, addresses the rumors, engages communities actively to help each other um, and interact with the government and other duty bearers on feedback and complaints. And during the recovery, um, we should learn. We should learn what worked and what didn't work and improve uh, our systems and uh, make sure that Next time, we will act better. Next slide, please. So, again, I don't want to go back to that, but communities and people are at the center of all our interventions, both in development and humanitarian settings. Um, if we want to reach those, and we want to reach everyone, we want to reach the most uh, underserved, the most marginalized, uh, we want to include those uh, whose voice usually is not heard. So we have a number of different tools and I won't stop, I won't uh, talk here about what can we do because it's a lot we can do. I will just provide some examples. We do have digital media, we do have online uh, possibilities and the best is to put all of this together to make sure uh, that things will, uh, you know, that, that people are heard and we make sure that uh, they are um, at the center of, of our interventions. Meaning we are doing with them, we are not doing for them. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, there are several uh, examples here and I don't want to, because uh, there are a lot of examples. Uh, so I don't want to uh, take too much time. You have all this information in the link which was shared. I will just go quickly uh, uh, through uh, all of these examples just to, uh, to make sure that, you know, to explain a bit what they are about. The first example is uh, from India, the JPPI initiative. Uh, which was developed 
together with uh, uh, one with Kerala um, government in, in India um, to facilitate the participation of affected populations both in development and then prepare them for potential emergencies because uh, Kerala is also at risk of excessive floods and landslides. So uh, how does it work? You can read a lot more in the materials. First of all, I want to say that uh, this initiative involved a, a large partnership with government and intergovernmental agencies, UN agencies, civil society in India, media, local NGOs, universities, um, and so on. And it worked with through the local self-government department, through self-help groups, uh, and uh, it's it's an initiative which reached phase two now and is working, is going on very well. Uh, next, uh, next slide. I will talk quickly about the uh, Nepal example, which is how do we use online and all offline tools for community feedback and social listening. And it's very, very small. I don't know if you see maybe better than me, uh, but um, I won't go into this again. You can read it yourself. Um, besides all the uh, tools to gather data, which are online and offline, uh, the um, uh, Nepal uh, country office also uh, developed a chatbot uh, for all three platforms, Viber, WhatsApp, and Messenger, gathering all the, all the questions and giving answers to all the burning questions people, journalists, uh, and activists can have. Next slide. This is about Nepal, uh, a myriad of different uh, type of interventions, starting with volunteers, scouts, uh, uh, media and talk walker, um, also um, well, helplines and uh, community radios and so on. Next slide. Yeah, that's another great example. Uh, uh, an example about in a, from Afghanistan about community engagement structures and accountability in health, uh, which uh, is bringing uh, you know, showing how uh, all the community structures get together, all community volunteers, community health workers, uh, influencers, and everyone is working together to, to reach the goal. Next slide, please. Uh, another example from Bhutan, where uh, the Scout Network is the largest uh, uh, youth network in Bhutan is engaged in in the activities, and they are uh, strategically partnering with UNICEF on that to make sure that uh, uh, they have access to all the communities uh, at the center, a certain point where um, it's needed. Next slide. Uh, another. Uh, Information Feedback Center in, in Cox Bazaar, which uh, is a network of 12 information feedback centers located in strategic points in camps. I won't explain what the camps are in Cox Bazaar, probably everyone is aware. Um, it's the largest refugee community. Um, so we do have a lot of interventions there and this information and feedback centers ensure the fact that every, even the most um, excluded is included because we do have youth volunteers and uh, mothers who are also visiting the households and talking to people, those who cannot come to the information and feedback centers. Next slide. Um, another interesting initiative to empower community leaders uh, in Sri Lanka is called Tireless uh, Hearts Behind COVID Response. As you see, it's a chatbot and uh, uh, an online training session was uh, 
provided to uh, almost 7,000 community leaders who uh, uh, will also go and talk to their communities about COVID and uh, gather information, ask questions and bring answers to the communities. Next. That's a very small one, so I won't go into the details, otherwise you won't uh, understand uh, what I'm talking about. I, uh, I encourage you to look at the presentation and all the documents which are shared by my colleagues in the chat. Uh, thank you very much for, for this opportunity. And I think that uh, it's a lot to say and uh, it's a lot of, of uh, a lot of information and a lot of things we need to put together to make sure that we have the same understanding of what AP is, what community feedback is, and how do we build the systems in the development to make sure that during the emergencies we have at least something and we don't start from scratch. Uh, but I will stop here. Thank you very much. Great. Excellent, Dorina. Thank you so much. That was another compelling um, case for really making that investment uh, in the development, uh, you know, uh, uh, interventions to, to make sure they are in place once a crisis strikes so that, uh, you know, um, and, and that you made a very strong case for that. And thank you for sharing all these best practices and examples of tools. Um, uh, just to, to remind everyone that this um, recording will be posted on the ISE website, uh, so you'll have the opportunity to, to um, you know, refresh yourselves and uh, look at the presentations um, then as well. Um, we'll now open it up for a question and answer um, session. Uh, we have uh, about 30 minutes uh, to go over that. Uh, we've been monitoring a little bit the, 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 the chat uh, uh, box. Thank you for sharing. Um, your comments there. Um, I will just uh, pick a few uh, uh, as a, a group of few, and then we'll turn uh, to the panelists to answer uh, or, or comment. Uh, and then um, we'll pick another few and we'll go from there. Um, one of the participants uh, shares the example of Northeastern Nigeria um, and, and mentioned that, you know, the, 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 there, the issue of localization um, has been prioritized and, and really sharing that as best practice to ensure um, this um, community engagement is um, prioritized through uh, localization. Um, and so that would be uh, great if uh, perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps Catherine, you can take that one, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, uh, elaborate a little bit more on uh, on this issue of how uh, localization of the humanitarian um, response really also supports um, AAP. Uh, another participant, um, uh, you know, asks about, um, you know, effective uh, uh, common uh, feedback uh, and uh, mechanisms um, and whether there is, um, you know, uh, really good practices in that regard. And perhaps Alex, Alex you can uh, take that. Um, another participants asked that, um, you know, comments that not all beneficiaries can read and write. Um, and so how can we uh, create more effective tools to, to hear their voice uh, during the response? And perhaps on this one, um, you know, I'll ask perhaps Leila if you have any thoughts on that. Um, and so uh, over to you first, Catherine. Thank you. And um, I, I like the suggestion coming from Northeast Nigeria because that's exactly what we're trying to do. I think um, actually um, uh, we have somebody who's called helping us to coordinate the Hingo Steering Committee who came from Nigeria um, and has been working very well with us on trying to do this. Ethiopia is a, a slightly different context because um, um, the civil society, national NGO community around the humanitarian response has not been as strong as it probably is in other African countries. Uh, and so there is a big mix of um, international NGOs as opposed to the national NGOs. And one of the strategies that I've tried to introduce over the two years that I've been here is to really build up the 
uh, really have an active localization um, strategy, which brings on board um, uh, many more um, human N NGOs that can work in the humanitarian space, um, but also those who can work in both humanitarian development. Now, the civil society law only came into effect, um, pro um, you know, 18 months ago, and so it's a work in progress. But this is something that we we what uh, we're focusing on to ensure that the what we call the localization or you know the nationalization of of the space of the humanitarian actors actually includes um, everything move for, moving forward and to be truth um, really what you're suggesting um, is that the accountability to affected populations even though the the international NGOs work directly with the national NGOs needs to be can only be fast tracked um, with the with the inclusion full inclusion of every all the partners at the lowest level at the household level where communities are and so this is um, something that we will be doing similar and so a good suggestion from your end. Thank you. Catherine, um, perhaps uh, Alexandra, if you can uh, perhaps answer the, the question, not only on the uh, collective kind of common approach to community engagement and, and, um, and um, having um, common feedback um, uh, mechanism, but also there was a question around how do you actually mainstream AAP throughout an entire organization? Um, uh, because, uh, you know, usually that's deprioritized. So over to you, Alexandra. Um, yeah, definitely. I think that's a, those are two big questions, which I could probably give a two hour webinar on. So I'll try to be really, really quick just to say that we have a lot of resources out there. Um, I mean, obviously we have a lot of collective resources, but I'm more familiar, of course, with the IFRC resources that are not just for national society, right across, right across national societies that anyone can use. We have just a brand new community engagement guide that was just, um, uh, launch in December, um, and we also have a feedback starter kit. Just to say that a lot of those questions that you have will be answered um, in in those tools. Um, so if you want some more practical application, but just generally in terms um, of of mainstreaming accountability and as well um, a successful kind of collective community feedback system goes back to what I said a bit in in my address was that um, you need buy in, you need buy in from leadership, and you need buy in to staff. So I think um, often these initiatives start at the technical level by those focal points, but um, uh, but we need to make sure that everyone in the organization, from leadership um, to different departments, even logistics or procurement. In my example from Mozambique, that was part of the challenge that we realized is that we hadn't engaged those colleagues that work in administration, in logistics and procurement who needed to adapt their work based on community feedback. So if you're going to mainstream accountability or even do uh, a collective community system, you need to have buy-in from every level of the organization and especially from, from leadership. Um, in terms of, of community systems specifically, um, I think we need to also be able to um, determine a bit the scale of, of the feedback mechanism and as well if is it going to be just a passive system in terms of if people come to us to provide feedback or a proactive system, which takes often more resources. Um, at IFRC and the Red Cross Red Cross, and I think for us, um, generally, we, we prefer a proactive system, system, so not to wait for communities to come and provide feedback to us, but rather, um, thanks to our, our network of volunteers, of course, we have the resources for that um, to really go to communities and hear what they have to say and, and, and capture this kind of qualitative information um, that is so valuable that, we'll, um, that ultimately we, we'll, will help us influence the way we work. Um, but also um, defining you know, the channels for feedback systems, so especially if it's a collective one, um, which channels are different organizations using, which uh, channels are trusted by communities, um, um, wh which role each organization has, what is the added value of each organization, and which um, channels should we leverage based on, on that experience. Um, as well, um, I think ultimately, which, you know, we, we, we go a bit too fast sometimes in planning feedback systems, but the most one of the most important bit is um, so, so to kind of establish a decision tree um, and as well, how are we going to share information from our, one organization to another when it's um, when it's a collective feedback system? But as well, um, how are we going to refer um, and how are we going to monitor, especially once we refer uh, people to different organizations, depending on, on the issue? 
um, how are we going to monitor that uh, the feedback has been addressed, that organizations have taken it up and acted on it? Um, and that's the $100 million question a little bit for feedback system because um, we can collect all the information and all the data we want and we can analyze it, which is a critical issue. Um, but if we are not equipped to address it and we don't go back to the community to, you know, of course, um, close the feedback loop, um, then the system is ineffective and, of course, um, it becomes an accountability issue and problem in itself. Um, so we really need to, to be able to, uh, to map out how every step is going to be um, taken care of by, um, by whom and how um, at when we set up such a, such a system. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that for now because, as I said, I could probably give a whole lecture on this um, and on just mainstreaming accountability, but I can maybe um, add on a few more details later on. Excellent. That was very helpful, Alexandra. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of uh, questions. Perhaps Leila, you can you can um, help. I think the one I mentioned earlier around you know there's the beneficiaries that are not that, that do not right read. How do you make sure that that they're effectively um, uh, uh, you know, included in, in the response. Uh, another one is around, uh, there is a comment uh, that, um, you know, the need to disrupt, you know, the power structures, uh, you know, really key as being key to moving forward on AAP. Um, this participant is actually questioning if that's possible. Uh, are we putting too much hope in localization? Uh, um, and so you ha you've shared a very um, practical example how you're doing that uh, at the HLG. So perhaps you can be, you know, share some specific details on how you went about um, doing that um, in Gaziantep and perhaps also a bit on the outcomes because uh, there was also another comment around other examples on how this actually has helped in terms of the response, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, fundraising and the actual response. So over to you, Tilela. Thank you. I will, uh, he will uh, help me, the translator of talk in Arabic and he will. With pleasure, yes. Okay, no excellent. I hope you understood that. Yeah, no, no, yeah yes. perfect. Okay, thank you. الأشخاص اللي ما بيقدروا يقرأوا فنحنا بالتأكيد أول جواب هو إنه نحنا حنعمل ريلاي على التكنولوجي مثل ما حكيت سابقا بالإضافة لاستخدام خبرتنا الكثير من التكنولوجي اليوم فيها تستخدم الرسائل الصوتية وفيها تستخدم الفيديوز بالإضافة إنه نحنا كمنظمات عمل إنساني عنا كثير إكسبرت بالتعامل مع إنه نعمل المواد كلها بلغة مناسبة للمجتمع مثل إذا عم نحكي مع الأطفال فبنعملها بلغة صديقة للطفل so definitely, as for the first question regarding those like not all beneficiaries can actually read or write, uh, the answer is yes, definitely. As I said earlier, we can rely on advanced technology. As I said, uh, at our NGOs at the local level, we do have lots of expertise and experiences where uh, through which we can use lots of diversified audio and visual tactics and uh, mechanisms and tools as well. Uh, in order to share such uh, expertise with the beneficiaries, for example, uh, to know what language we use with uh, each and exact community. For example, if we are addressing children, then we can use a children-friendly tools and language. بالإضافة حتى فينا نحكي عن disabilities people. غالباً المواد لازم تتحول لمواد قابلة للقراءة من disabilities يعني الأشخاص اللي ما بيقدروا يسمعوا نحنا لازم نتأكد إنه في visual يقدروا يشوفوها واللي ما بيقدروا يشوفوا كمان لازم نعتمد على الأنظمة الصوتية So yes, even uh, with the people with disabilities, we can help them a lot uh, For example, we can, for those who cannot hear, we can have uh, visual uh, uh, kind of tools and for those who cannot uh, uh, see we can use the uh, audio and acoustic tools in order to communicate better with them. إذا رجعنا للبرزنتيشن حنلاقي في مثال كثير واضح بأنه لمدة عشر سنين نحن كنا عم نقدم شيلتر، الشيلتر هو مؤقت وفي أنواع من الشيلتر، اللي صار هو نحن لما شاركنا هدول الأشخاص ودخلناهم على اجتماع مع دايركت مع مع 
مع الديسيجن ميكر مثل ما حكيت سابقا صار في تغيير ل ل للميثودولوجي بال بال بالاستجابه لهدول الاشخاص لانه سمعنا منهم مباشره بعد ثلاث اجتماعات او بعد اجتماعين فورا صار في صار في بلان كثير واضحه انه كيف نحن حننتقل من مرحله الشلتر المؤقت اللي اللي ما اللي ما له سستينبل لشلتر هو بضل فتره اطول السبب المباشر فيني احكي اليوم هو مشاركة الأشخاص بشكل مباشر وفي هذا اليوم بتذكر أنه اللي دخلت حكيت ما بتعرف تقرأ هي سيدة كبيرة بالعمر بس حكيت لهم ببساطة بلغة البسيطة هذا الشلتر كيف عم يأثر عليها So yes definitely as for the second question it was very clear in my presentation as I've said over the past 10 years we have been given timber shelter for the affected populations in the northwest of Syria. And we decided it was time to change this methodology. And it is very important to have those people included in the process of the decision making. So we uh, did create this kind of shift transformation in the methodology and the response as well. So they were included. And after two or three sessions and meetings for the HLG level, where some of the beneficiaries were actually there attending the meeting, uh, participating uh, and sharing their own insights on the uh, situation and the overall situation. There was very crystal clear action plan that was taken to change the entire Berman shelter into a better dignified shelter with better and dignified living conditions for the next year. And so what we did was very simple. We had all those voices included conveyed and heard then we had them participating in the process of the decision making and by the way the lady who attended was illiterate she was a very elderly woman and she spoke uh, she has spoken in a very clear language talking about her knees and the way that she thinks it is better for her to move from the tumor shelter into a better dignified shelter yes thank you غالبا بعد عمل فتره لفتره طويله بنتحول شوي نحن لانه نحن اشخاص تكنيكال كعمال انسانيين بنتحول ل... لاشخاص نشتغل باليه السبلاي تشين وهذا اللي هذا اللي عم نحاول نعمله بالمشاركه الفعاله مع مع الافكتد بيبول اللي هو على كل الاصعده انا اعطيت مثال الاتش ال جي بس نحن المشاركه عم تتم عن طريق الاجتماعات المباشره معهم عن طريق دخولهم بكل بروسيس مثل ما حكوا الزملاء So yes, definitely. This is the very core of our work here as humanitarian uh, actors and workers, changing this traditional uh, way of thinking and uh, mentality. It is active participation for the affected populations. So not only I give the HLG meeting as an example, but actually we are talking on all levels. We do have direct meetings with them. We sit with them. We talk to them. We listen to them so that we have all their insights and ideas being reflected in our decision making process. Okay, I have answered this question and I would be glad to answer any other question. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, Leila. That was very comprehensive. Um, uh, uh, perhaps um, I'll turn um, to, um, uh, to, to Dorina uh, for this one. Um, what are some of the good practices of AAP in the context of durable solutions and in particular resettlements? Uh, given that some decisions pertaining to the refugees are beyond the control of, of, of UNHCR partners. Um, um, Doreen, I don't know if you mind uh, taking a stab at that one. I think Lila could answer it better than myself uh, in this case. Uh, so, um, um, uh, uh, Dorina, yeah. perhaps I'll 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 uh, turn to you. There's uh, there's been a couple of um, comments yeah. and questions on how do you actually um, uh, you know kind of show that leadership um, on on AAP. Um, you know, even though there are some um, uh, you know it's it's an incredibly challenging 
uh, uh, issue as it involves, you know, really changing the mindset and and really goes against uh, kind of the, the 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 structure. So, how do you give that uh, kind of uh, some teeth? I think well, the one of the com participants said to AAP, and also uh, practically how you mainstream it throughout the whole um, response. I know uh, all the the presentations have has kind of have alluded to that, but I think it seems like you know if you can share a little bit more. On, on some of your experience on that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I think the first is to ensure the leadership commitment and to uh, make sure everyone, all the humanitarian ac actors are around the same table and discuss and speak the same language. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, everyone is doing uh, the, his work in, uh, in, uh, in different communities and no, nobody knows uh, what others are doing. So um, we end up with uh, uh, some communities left out, for example, and uh, some some people who are not included. Uh, that's, uh, that's the first. Then in practical terms, um, it should be included in all the programming. And as I said, uh, systems should be built before. And when we talk about AP, AP and feedback mechanisms is a small, small part of the community engagement system, which should be built uh, and uh, meaning working and mapping the main influencers at community level, make sure that uh, they understand their role. Also make sure they understand they have to include the most marginalized and uh, having uh, uh, the platforms of discussions and dialogue at community level and having uh, different, using different communication channels, uh, using the, uh, for example, sometimes religious leaders, uh, sometimes grandmothers or uh, elder, uh, elders or, uh, you know, young people. Uh, make sure that that everyone is heard and uh, uh, the intergenerational dialogue is also happening. So all of this work should be done a lot before because when there is a huge emergency and uh, it, it's not so easy to make sure that we have all uh, we have we know all those people and we have all the resources and we can engage everyone. Uh, in in the uh, in the response, so uh, that's that's the first uh, I would say the first step. Uh, then um, I've I've seen a few questions about Bangladesh, and maybe I could answer those. Uh, Please go ahead. Uh, so, um, what were the challenges uh, and uh, the lessons learned from Bangladesh uh, information and feedback centers? Um, so one lesson, lesson learned is that fixed information and feedback centers uh, don't work very well. We need to have also a mobile component. People, young people, women going around in the community and making sure they deliver information and they gather feedback and they go and bring answers to, to the respective feedback. Uh, another issue is to be creative. That's a lesson learned. Not only sit uh, on, a, on a chair waiting for people to come or going around, but also making sure that you use any uh, any tools available like radios, speakers, mics, um, informal leaders, and so on. Uh, another challenge and, and uh, a lesson is linked to data entry analysis, um, providing feedback, but most, um, the most important is also how do we use this uh, uh, feedback for um, in programming, how do we adjust our interventions based on what people are saying? How quickly this can happen? How do we integrate this uh, into existing already donor funded proposals, which you know are already pre-established in a way? Uh, so this is uh, an, 
so flexibility is is another uh, uh, point we need to take into account. Um, and of course, community engagement is the core of the response. Community feedback mechanism, and I saw several comments about that. Community feedback or the grievances mechanisms are a, a part of it, but not all of it. Uh, the community engagement is uh, at, the, at the core and the systems should be built um, uh, beforehand. And uh, the, the, the last uh, I, I wanted to say is that many, many agencies had information, different kind of information centers in, in the uh, Cox's Bazaar in the refugee camps. And uh, the coordination wasn't quite there. So the idea at the end was to create a, a, an information hub sub working group uh, for the camps to make sure that everyone sits at the table and coordinates to have the stand standard SOPs um, to make sure that all the, uh, the small, the challenges, small or big come to this group and are discussed and so on. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dorina. Um, I think, unfortunately, we only have about 10 minutes left before we, we, we close. So I'm going to just pick two questions uh, and, um, and for, for all four pa panelists to, to come in on. The first one um, is around um, accountability, any specific priorities and challenges related to ensuring accountability for women and girls, um, including to um, gender-based violence. Um, um, and so that's one. Um, and then the second one is, um, you know, given this, I think all of you have emphasized the need to really invest uh, in this in a very, very um, consistent way in a big way. Um, and so, and that requires funding uh, in most cases as well. So how can we bring in donors uh, to really um, support this, um, uh, you know, the, this, the, these efforts? Um, and so perhaps, um, uh, Catherine, I'll turn to you um, to, 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 to start. Thanks, Ida. And uh, I don't know if I have all the answers, but I think that the accountability for women and girls is part of the accountability for affected populations. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the most difficult bits, um, just building on what Dorina has said, is really what are the incentives um, for, for leadership um, at all levels with um, that lead the humanitarian community in order to ensure that AAP actually takes place. Um, and I think we have to use the existing HR tools that include performance appraisals of all people engaged in delivering. It means that even myself as the HC, for instance, in the compact that I have with the ERC, this is one of the deliverables. I'm being held accountable to ensure that AAP is at the center of the response. And you can give examples of what that happens, but it needs to happen throughout this. It needs to happen with donors. It needs to happen with UN agencies. It needs to happen with the country directors, very similar to what is happening with PSEA. So with PSEA, everybody's having to sign off a code of conduct for all staff, whether they're doorkeepers, whether they're gatekeepers, whether they're accountants, whether they're in all the system. But then there needs to be incentives and sanctions if it doesn't happen. I think that, you know, otherwise we can talk about it and it sounds like a great idea. One of the challenges I have as HC on the ACT, of course, is that not, not everybody's accountable to me. I'm only responsible for the heads of agencies and can in put into their performance at the end of the year, but for the donors and everybody else, there needs to be some trust building that goes along. And so the accountability for women and girls falls to that. In terms of the, the, the dedicated funding for the accountability, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, accepting with humility that what was mentioned at the beginning about trust, that if we don't put the resources to this, really the trust will not be brought. And it will, and and we, you know, the communities will will not um, um, take on board what it is that we put there. So the the donors are part of the HCT. The donors are part of the country-based pooled funding. Um, there's many engagements. You do joint missions and all the rest of it that we put there. And we need to make sure that specific budget line 
must be a component um, in the in the planning. That's why we said for every part of the planning cycle from beginning to implementation, and then for M and E as you do the whole cycle, that is part of the system. If without the resources, I'm afraid that this trust um, issue will be broken and we will not be able to. But that's what we're trying to do here in Ethiopia. Thanks very much, Ida. Excellent. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, Leila, I'll turn to you if you want to say a few words uh, uh, to complement what Catherine um, just said. Thank you. I will rely on my, <laughs> on my yes, sir. on Hamad also. بس بدي أحكي عن قضية شماعي في حكي لكوتا كاثرين حأحكي عن قضية المسائلة للنساء والأطفال أنا نصيحتي أنه نتأكد بمرحلة لما عم نجمع المعلومات ما قبل الديزاين أنه نشركن هن كنساء بجمع الداتا وتحليل الداتا يعني غالبا عم نعتمد على الموظفين المنظمات نفسها وممكن يكونوا أغلبهم رجال فأول نصيحة مشان ما عيد الحكي اللي حكته زميلتي كاثرين إنه نحن نشرك النساء نفسهم بجمع المعلومات وبتحليلها. So yes, uh, actually uh, I want to be to what Catherine has just brilliantly explained, but regarding the accountability towards uh, the AIBs, especially for uh, mm -hmm. women and children, uh, we need to make sure that women themselves are included and here i'm talking about the pre-design phase once we uh collect the data once we analyze the data women should be there at the very center of these two very important uh, elements so to speak so usually the majority of the organization what they do is that they rely on their own staff that is mainly men so the solution is that no we need to have women there in to have women in the process of collecting the data and analyzing the data. Thank you. In respect to the question that I read, even if I didn't نعمل empowerment للأفكتد people ونكون جاهزين لنعيد صياغة رسائلهم بحيث تكون ملائمة ليسمعوا الدونر وهي التجربة هاي عم أحكي عن تجربة بال HLG في بعض الدونر بيحضروا ال HLG وعملت shifting هاي المداخلات لهذا السبب فنحن بدنا نعمله empowerment كيف يحكوا رسائلهم بشكل فعال لل AAB كيف لل affected people بقصد وكيف وبالإضافة للغة فلازم يكون نحن دورنا ك organization نكون نحن ال bridge بينهم وبين هدول الأشخاص ويكون هن عادي معه so yes, as for the second question regarding uh, the donors, and I guess very clearly we need to be brave uh, to make them uh, listen to what the uh, affected uh, people do have. We need to rephrase the messages of the affected people. Uh, we need to uh, do this very bravely. I know it's very uh, daring, it's very challenging, but I am talking about an experience that we did ourselves. This is evidence-based. We did this in our uh, meetings of the HLG. There are some donors who actually attend those meetings. So every time we want the voices of the affected people to be there, we ask them to attend those uh, meetings. We uh, make advocacy for their uh, messages, how they can be conveyed. We also uh, rely on the uh, language. It should be simple, how to uh, channel the messages in the right way. And I guess one more time, we are the bridge. Uh, we are this kind of linkage between uh, the African populations and the donors. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Leila. Um, Alexandra, over to you. Um, just very quickly. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be super quick. Just one thing I've noticed that a lot of people today have used the word beneficiary, and I'm not somebody to be politically correct generally, but I think if we're going to change the mindset, I think language does matter to some extent. And I know for us at AFRC, we did a lot of advocacy internally to stop using that word. And we've banned it, if I can say, from, from appeals and from emergency plan of actions and whatnot. So um, it wasn't an easy thing to do. But um, And I think it it's really important to show that uh, we're ready to change our mindset. Um, by modeling a little bit that language. So, um, so maybe if we can commit to at least try for that um, this time around, and then hopefully that, that will open doors to, to change a bit more uh, for now. So that's just a quick message. 
on my end. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Um, so, Darina, uh, last but not least, a few uh, last words. Thank you. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, I think that's this is just the beginning of a, of a great discussion uh, we should have all together to understand how to better listen to people and how to work with them, not for them. Uh, so I'm happy to be part of this uh, discussion today, and I hope other discussions around these issues will will come. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dorina. Um, I would like to thank. Uh, our panelists very much for the excellent uh, briefings and, and incredibly rich uh, presentations and, and, and the discussion. Uh, we've had a huge turnout. Um, so thank you so much for the participants for also turning up and, and engaging. Um, I personally found this to be incredibly energizing and and hope I, I would uh, you know that we, as as many of you have, have indicated it is a, a daunting task uh, given um, that the system really uh, was not set up uh, it's uh, that the humanitarian action is a uh, you know I think someone said supply driven um, and that uh, you know that accountability to affected populations is not really kind of had not has not been at the forefront uh, and it really requires a power shift. However, from this discussion and for the panelists um, themselves, it's clear that it's not an impossible uh, task. Um, and uh, actually, there's a sea change. I mean, I I felt the sea change uh, right now on just hearing about all the good work, the good practice, some of the lessons learned uh, that each of you are are, are bringing um, to this, which is incredibly inspiring. Um, and so thank you very much. But I, I think as, as all of you in some way or another have said, it requires a lot of investment. Um, it's challenging. There's still a lot to be done. Um, and so uh, both at the kind of local level, national level, um, system-wide, there needs to be a lot more invested um, in terms of just prioritizing this, but also in terms of financial and tools. And uh, we've heard and seen that, that this is, uh, you know, been developed and that there's more and more commitment towards that. There are global tools that have been shared um, and are, are being developed um, constantly to support this effort. Uh, but I really honestly want to thank all of you for your leadership and for, for being uh, so ready to present this. I think it's it's been incredibly um, helpful um, uh, to me um, personally, but I'm sure to everyone uh, uh, here. The This recording uh, will be posted. There'll be a recording that we posted on our website. So more people get to get to benefit from, from this discussion. Um, and so um, I know, um, I think Ali has put uh, the link um, uh, to this, um, and so you you will get to, to revisit uh, this discussion, and and, and also share it uh, more broadly. Um, so thank you very much, and uh, we'll have more um, uh, of these briefings uh, this uh, in two thousand twenty two. So please stay tuned. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank so you very much. Thank bye. you. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye-bye.